I now call upon David Grant to deliver the 151st commencement address at Boston University. Thank you uh, so much uh, uh, for that lovely introduction. And hello and congratulations to the Boston University graduating class of 2024. I am so incredibly honored to be here, but I must begin with a small confession. The ritual of a commencement speaker is supposed to be for some wizen and perhaps balding professional to impart some wisdom to a young, brilliant, hopeful graduating body. Yet when the president of BU reached out to me to speak today, I thought, well, yes, I'm balding, but I am in many ways a failure of a graduate. Back in 1994, when I left Boston University with a master's degree in creative writing, I dreamed of becoming a novelist. Like you, I'd study with some of the great professors and practitioners in their fields. I learned from two Nobel Prize laureates, Saul Bellow and Elie Wiesel, and from such talented novelists as Margot Livesey and Jane Ann Phillips. And yet the only novel I ever wrote was so bad it was roundly and deservedly rejected. And the unpublished manuscript sits in my attic now being nibbled on by mice. As you imagine your future, it is easy to see it as a journey on a predetermined path. This logical story with a pristine beginning and middle with everything seemingly building towards its inevitable triumphant end. Yet the truth is that these quests and the quests you are all about to begin today rarely turn out exactly as envisioned. They have unforeseen twists and wondrous discoveries that you could never imagine. But they also have those episodes that don't make it into your official bio or resume, even though they are, in many ways, the most important. Those times when things went wrong, sometimes even disastrously. So let me tell you my story, the unvarnished one. It begins, as you might imagine, out of a bit of desperation. I'd recently been hired at the New Yorker magazine as a reporter, a place I'd long aspired to work at. But I couldn't find my next story, and I was way behind. My wife and I had just had a baby boy, and I was terrified that I might lose my new coveted job. And so I was calling everybody I knew, begging, do you have a story idea? Do you have a story idea? Finally, I called a friend of mine here in Boston who said, well, why don't you look for the giant squid? That would make some news. Now, the only notion I had of a giant squid was from the novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. You know, this monstrous behemoth creature with tentacles attacking a submarine. I always figured the whole thing was a myth, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. But I looked up giant squid in the encyclopedia. Believe it or not, back then, that's how we used to do research. And sure enough, the creature known as Architeuthis, was not only real, it was considered the largest invertebrate on Earth. It had tentacles sometimes as long as school buses and eyes the size of human heads. Though the giant squid was very real, it remained a puzzling mystery. No scientist had ever seen one swimming in the ocean or capture one alive. Indeed, they only knew these creatures existed because occasionally their dead carcasses would wash ashore. And so I was suddenly back to panicking, that sense of terror that Michael spoke to earlier. How could I ever tell this story? There's nothing to see. But I kept frantically researching, and I eventually discovered that, lo and behold, not only are there giant squid, there are also giant squid hunters. Now that's a profession I bet nobody at BU told you about. <laughs> These hunters had spent decades prowling the high seas, determined to be the first to ever capture a live giant squid. To them, it was like landing on the moon. The most maniacal of all these hunters was a marine biologist in New Zealand named Steve O'Shea, a man so obsessed, he kept bodies of dead giant squid in his garage, and he put on a gas mask to dissect them. Apparently, they're very stinky. And O'Shea had come up with a radical idea. Rather than attempt to capture a mature giant squid, what some called the big calamari, he planned to catch a baby. Now this seems kind of nuts, right? 
If you can't find a 60-foot giant squid, how are you going to capture one the size of a cricket? Yet there was a certain genius to his plan. Like many sea creatures, the giant squid would hatch many babies. And so in theory, there should be more of them in the water, and they wouldn't be able to dart away as quickly. When I called O'Shea in New Zealand, he said, come on down, mate. I'm about to head out on an expedition, and we'll make history. Now, like I said, I was kind of desperate, and so I ran to my editors. They are the best in the world, which is why they sometimes ask these persnickety little questions like, if we're going to send you halfway around the globe, what are you going to find? And it is possible, just possible, that in my desperation to convince them that it made absolutely perfect sense to send a reporter across the globe to capture a creature that had never been caught for thousands of years, I may have just a wee bit slightly exaggerated and oversold the story. I cited everything from maps to squid migration patterns and assured them, as Ashe had told me, we're going to make history. So they gave me their blessing, and off I went to New Zealand. And the moment I arrived, the ominous signs began. I had pictured us embarking in some large high-tech vessel, like the kind Jacques Cousteau had, or you see on the Discovery Channel with these robotic arms and submersibles. But O'Shea had virtually bankrupted himself chasing his dream squid. And his vessel, if you can call it that, turned out to be little more than a 20-foot skiff with an outboard motor. What's more, his crew, his so-called squid squad, consisted of merely a graduate student who got seasick. And little old me. <laughs> then O'Shea said, I should warn you, mate. There's a bit of a cyclone coming our way. <laughs> well, I said, that's OK. We'll just wait out the storm. But as you'll soon find out, you're always learning surprising things on your life's journey. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. Squid only spawn during this period off the coast of New Zealand. And if we didn't go then, we'd lose our chance. By this time, there were gale force wind winds, and the, and the power had gone out on the island, and the government had called up the National Guard. And that's when I learned yet again something else new on my life's journey. Apparently, you can only hunt for giant squid at night, because that's when they are supposed to rise in the water column to feed. And so as the sun was going down over the stormy ocean, we launched the skiff. There was a buoy marking the channel, and O'Shea pointed to it and asked, what color is that? He was deaf in one ear from a diving accident, spoke with a bit of a murmur. I said, it's green, can't you see it? I'm not just deaf, mate, he said, I'm colorblind. <laughs> I quietly slipped on my life jacket and asked, where are we going? He pointed at some shadowy forms looming ahead. I couldn't tell what they were at first, but as we got closer, I realized there were these enormous, jagged rocks, two rows of them, and the whole ocean seemed to be funneling through them, these tsunamis of water just gushing through, and he said, that's where we're going, and he sped right into it. He had given me a flashlight, and I aimed it in front of us. All I could see was a 20-foot wall of water. I took the flash and I looked behind me, and all I could see was another 20-foot wall of water. And the whole boat was going like this, rolling and shimming and heaving and skidding toward the rocks. We soared over a cresting wave, then plunged downward, the hull smacking so violently against the water that it sent my notepad and my pen flying. O'Shea said, you won't find this in New York, will you, mate? And for the first time, I began to wonder whether my captain was fully in command of all his faculties. But somehow, Shea skillfully steered us safely through the chute and into an inlet, the perfect spot, as he proclaimed, for hunting giant squid. He had built this elaborate baby giant squid trap, which was made from mesh netting, a hula hoop, a glass tank, and I swear, the top half of plastic Coke bottles. Now, normally, my job as a reporter is strictly to observe, which I'm pretty good at, but there were only three of us, and O'Shea put me to work. He said, if I don't find the baby giant squid, I'm ruined. And I thought, well, so am I. <laughs> we hauled the 50-pound trap in and out of the water until our hands burned. Each time we retrieve it, there'd be a rush of expectation. Is it there? Is it there? But then nothing. 
diddly. We worked till dawn. When we went out again the next night, O'Shea insisted, they're out there, I know they're out there, we just have to go further out. He led us further and further into the rougher, tumbling ocean, the graduate student looking, graduate student looking increasingly green. And this pattern went on night after night. Finally, one moonless evening, we pulled up the trap and the graduate student shined the flashlight and said, what's that? O'Shea peered closer and said, heaven help us. It looks like Arky, meaning Architeuthis, the giant squid. I stared at it and though it was only the size of a thumbnail, I could see its eye. I could see its bullet shaped head. I could see its tentacles. I never felt such exhilaration. I glanced at O'Shea and I could see the mad, delirious joy on his face. I could already imagine my editor's reaction when they heard the news, which would soon ricochet around the globe. The first ever reported discovery of a living giant squid, story by David Gran. We had to transfer the squid into a container to transport it. Now you have to understand we were exhausted and bleary-eyed. And as we lifted the tank, struggling to balance against the pounding waves, O'Shea yelled, steady, mate, steady. We began to pour it into the container when something happened. Where did it go, O'Shea said. <laughs> Where is the bloody thing? He put his hands in the tank, swirling around and cried, it has to be here. But the baby was gone, and O'Shea tumbled backward in despair. And in that instant, all I could think was, I'm dead. I'm dead. I've been out here in New Zealand for weeks. I persuaded my editors that we were going to find this thing, and we had it. And then, what, lost it? What kind of story was that? There was no climactic ending except perhaps the spectacular end of my career. After the dismal failure of our expedition, we drove back in his car, and it was only on the way when O'Shea vowed that he would never give up, that I realized what had happened on the boat was not only a story. That's what it sounded like out there a little bit at sea. It was not only a story, it was far more interesting and revealing about the human condition than anything I had concocted in my imagination. This was a story about an obsessive man who searched for the giant squid was less about the outcome than the very quest itself. True life, as Sherlock Holmes put it, can be infinitely stranger than anything that the mind could invent. And I realized that I had finally found my calling as a writer of nonfiction. I had begun a completely new, unforeseen journey. And to me, that is what my education and your education at BU has provided you. Of course, it has given you the skills and the knowledge to succeed, but it has given you something far more valuable and essential, the ability to take risks, and yes, at times, even to stumble and fail. It has taught you to think, frankly, critically, nimbly, unflinchingly, and to learn from those moments, to re-examine and reassess and forge onward, realizing your long-held dream, or perhaps a new, unexpected one. Your journey is not predetermined, which at times can make it unnerving. Surely, there will be things out there you won't find here, mates. But that is also what makes it an adventure a journey of discovery. I doubt you will get the things you dare to try as opposed to the things you don't. I certainly never regretted trying to write fiction. It shaped the writer I am. And often the most rewarding moments of our quest are the ones born of seeming setbacks, the ones that opened our eyes to new possibilities and led to triumphant ends we could not fathom. Each of your odysseys will be distinctive, your goals wonderfully and spectacularly varied. But there is one ideal, especially as terriers, you should, that should always bind you. 
and that is to see beyond your own journey and into the journey of others. The only part of the story I told you about that I do regret is that in that moment on the boat when we lost the baby, I, th I thought first of myself rather than O'Shea. Our quests are all interdependent, radiating outward and shaping the course of others, creating a much larger venture of organizations and communities, and yes, even nations. Your teachers and administrators and families who made sacrifices to help you reach this glorious moment today are a powerful reminder of that ideal, an ideal that this world needs now more than ever. So let us salute them. Finally, let me once more congratulate the great graduating class of 2024. Bon voyage as you venture forth from the BU beach and chase whatever your dream giant squid might be. Godspeed to you all.